Thank you, Chris. I keep forgetting that. In doing so, he left the confines of his temple to travel extensively to the major centres of learning in Japan, returning in 1255 to announce his conclusion on the 28th of April of that year. In proclaiming the practice of chanting Nam Myoho Renge Kyo and rejecting the major forms of Buddhism prevailing at the time, Nichiren would undoubtedly have caused a stir. So basically, at that year, 1253, he basically said, listen, all of your ideas of Buddhism is totally incorrect. The priests are not more powerful than me and my disciples. And so that was the kind of, it was truly transformative. And I know to all of the people on this call right now, it, it does it like it seems kind of normal. We've grown up kind of with all these books and stuff that are teaching us that you know you have that same potential. But truly, in them times, it was um, it was so unprecedented for someone, especially a monk who would who was so um renowned for being such a deep studier, to say that you know your government, Babylon, all of you, you're doing it wrong. I think that's where I get kind of my spirit to remonstrate with Babylon and government as well. It's like you know, <laughs> he did it. So, as an exclusive practice to reveal one's enlightened life in the moment, Nichiren's advocation of the Daimoku was revolutionary, and Daimoku means chanting nam myoho renge kyo It is worth noting that the phrase nam myoho renge kyo may not have been invoked regularly or with any focus prior to Nichiren, but that Nichiren did not invent the Daimoku. nam myoho renge kyo existed before Nichiren, and was one Japanese translation of the Chinese title of the Lotus Sutra, with the nam meaning respect or devotion to, attached to the start of it. The earliest authenticated use of the Daimoku phrase has been found in a written prayer on the occasion of a memorial service of the deceased parents in 881 CE. By the way, this information here blew me away. I read this information this year in 2021. I've been practicing six years and I never knew. I believed up until 2021 that Nichiren was the first ever to, to bring about the word Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. But in fact, it says here, it's actually just the Chinese translation of what we were studying before, the Lotus Sutra. Um, but before Nitran's time, the only ever like time it was ever seen, the earliest authenticated use was for a prayer for someone's parents who had passed away. But up until then, no one had actually took the, the title of the Lotus Sutra and recognized by chanting it, we can transform. Or in this day and age, using science, we can actually attain, um, we can step into the quantum field. And that's what he was trying to, that's what Nitran basically did. Nitrin believed that his predecessors, so the people that like he looked up to, Nitrin believed that his predecessors, Dengyo and Tientai, knew of Nam Yoharenge Kyo, but the time was not right to propagate it. In any event, Nitrin's declaration was a radical departure in the history of religion, which would have a major impact on the world. Tradition describes how the outrage engendered by Nitrin's announcements meant he had to flee almost immediately from Tojo Kanjanobu, a local steward who was incensed by the criticism of the established Buddhist schools. Most recent re uh, historical research suggests that Nitrin may not have had to leave until the winter of 1254, perhaps a year later, and that his presence gradually polarised the community in Sija G into those who supported Nitrin's new position and those who held to the beliefs of the tradition of the Tendai Buddhism practiced at the temple at that time. So basically, when in, in 1253, when Nitrin went, Nam Myoho Renge Kyo, if you chant this, all ordinary people and the priests, we can attain enlightenment in this lifetime. What we're taught as Buddhists and SGI members is that basically he, he had to run straight, he had to leave because pe the whole government was like, we have to kill this man, he's becoming too powerful and he's gonna, and he's gonna basically take the power away from us. But what the author here is basically saying is that in deeper research, and not many SGI members know this, is that actually he may not have actually had to leave. Maybe he left about a year after he first ever proclaimed this. So this is actually cutting edge um, knowledge that not even many SGI members even know. The historian Takaji has also suggested Kanjanobu's uh, ear at Nitrin, which was clear from the source materials derived not me merely from the lotus centered practice Nitrin advocated, but because he had supported the local landlord a nun called Neijo no Ama against the competing clans of Kenjinobu at the shogunate appointed overlord. This conflict would culminate in 1264 at Komatsubara when Nitrin returned home again and Kanjinobu had a band of men ambush him, severely injuring Nitrin and killing two of his followers. So what it's basically just saying there is that at one point Nitrin even started to help different people, you know, and he started to really start to empower different powerful people in the government and etc. And, uh, one time when Nitrin came back, the government tried to kill him for that. So this is an outsider all of his life. The persecutions by Kanjinobu was, however, incidental to the power of the shogunate government who Nitrin came into direct conflict with, resulting in two perilous exiles and a near execution. From birth, Nitrin was an outsider. 
According to Nitrin, he was born to a poor fishing family through some academic conjecture. His father may have had highly social standing in the past and fallen from grace. Nitrin may even have been adopted, a suggestion supported by the types of words he used in his writings to refer to his, uh, his mother. It is, however, worth noting theories may have been created by later disciples trying to provide Nitrin with a noble background to further validate his status. Regardless, he would most likely have had a strong regional accent from the Kanto area where he grew up, in contrast to the refined ways of speaking promoted in Kamakura and Kyoto by the upper echelons of society. In fact, in 1269, Nitrin wrote to a disciple studying in Kyoto, encouraging him to use your own provisional speech rather than adopt to the manners of the court nobility. The imperial aristocracy were also dominant in positions of authority within the Buddhist order and viewed the Kanto region where Nitru came from as a provincial backwater. It is therefore likely that during Nitrin's years of studying at the major centres of Buddhist learning, he would have been able to access the libraries and texts, but not the Arakas aristocratic factions who dominated the higher ranks of the clergy. The tradition that he may have been a disciple of Shunpan, the senior Tendai scholar on Mount Hai, is unlikely and not supported by Nitrin's writings, though he may have attended his lectures. Takaji suggested that his rejection in his student days may have inspired his axiom, rely on the law, not upon persons, which Nitrin took from the Nirvana Sutra. And that quote right here, rely on the law, not on the person, is something I'm really I'm trying to deep in my life of course we have leaders of course we have sensei we call him or Daisaku Akita the president of the SGI and you know I have my local London leaders and stuff but above all we have to rely on the law the the mystic law the 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 universe our heart connection our connection with God Jah Allah whatever you want to call it that's what we rely on most never the people and it's saying here even in Nitra's times when he was studying there may have even been a chance that he wasn't even allowed to study with the top echelons of society and by doing that he realized to never rely on the people on the law so without privilege or vested interest Nitrin could place a critical eye on the practices and beliefs on his day to ascertain the cause of the problems and suffering plague in society in rejecting the practice of praying to the outwell, uh, otherworldly Buddha, Amida, to realize a release from suffering in a paradise after death, Nichiren put himself on a collision course with the Bafufu, the shogun-led government of the day. Unable to receive an official hearing, Nichiren became more adversarial in the fact, in the face of the persecutions that assailed him, and as sanctions and suppression flowed, Nichiren and his followers became more marginalized in the eyes of society. This, in turn, conversely helped Nichiren to define his philosophy in opposition to the religions and political authorities of the day, summarized by his declaration, even if it seems, and this is my favorite, this is my favorite, even if it seems because I was born in the ruler's, ruler's domain, I follow him in my actions, I will never follow him in my heart. One more time, even if it seems that because I was born in the ruler's domain, I follow him in my actions, I will never follow him in my heart. And that's my attitude towards B Babylon right now. With his unremitting passion and courage to elicitate the Buddhist law, Nitrin saw himself and his followers, who at their peak in his lifetime may have only numbered a couple of hundred, uh, a couple of thousand, not as a rejected minority, but as Jacqueline Stone described, as centre stage of their historical movement, liberated and joyfully empowered. As experienced, as an experience inspired by Nitrin himself. Now, I read this on the train today and it's really inspired me because what are we doing this for? Why am I teaching you about Buddhism? Is how can we learn about, how can we take the teachings of Shakyamuni or the stories of Nitrin and how he was persecuted and how he kept on remonstrating with government? How can we take that and how can Muna and Maria and Angelina and Sally and me and Chris and Kez, how can we take these stories and empower ourselves to, to, challenge, uh, to challenge the authority of today or to challenge when we're being slandered? And so this really listen to this because this is the author's personal story about how he took Nitrin's examples of you know remonstrating with the government and in a small way applied it to his own life and if you can take any inspiration from it it's, it's, this is the chapter so an experience inspired by Nitrin's example Nitrin's fearless resolve in the face of rejection and persecution from the authorities is a timeless example of how to respond to oppression and injustice taking inspiration from his struggles I have been able to muster courage and to face some challenging times in my life with a fighting spirit. One example which has come, which has had a major impact on my circumstances was when I was purchasing our family home. Early on in my Buddhist practice, I had been encouraged to set 10 year determinations. What did I, 
What did I want mine and others' lives to be like in a decade's time? These were tangible goals, which included buying a house in my local neighbourhood in London. This specific resolution seemed particularly outlandish, as I was then in my first year of teaching on a relatively low salary. House prices in London had skyrocketed since the late 1990s and my local area was expensive. With encouragement that nothing is impossible, I set this determination along with a number of other aspirations for myself and for, hap and for the happiness of others on New Year's Eve and chanted that night towards them. In the intervening 10 years, this ambition was not always at the forefront of my mind. Life's up and downs made it seem impossible at times and yet, give or take a couple of months, 10 years to the date of setting that goal, my family and I successfully purchased a beautiful spacious house in my local area. We had chanted that the place would not only be a wonderful family home, but would create value by, seeing, by being used to host local Buddhist meetings for our community. The elderly lady who was selling the house had chosen our offer above a larger one put forward by a property developer because she wanted to see the family move into um, her home. In the UK, the process of finalising the buying and selling of a property is quite protracted. Signing of contracts and completion of the deal usually happens just before moving in and vendors and purchasers can pull out or arrangements can be cancelled at the last minute. Everything was going smoothly towards our purchase and when we was near to moving in. I was busy at work when the bank we had arranged the finance with, one of the largest in the country, called me. I presumed it was for some tiresome customer survey and so I did not get round to calling them back for two weeks. When I finally did call, the news was bad. The operative told me that my mortgage offer had been cancelled. Despite my pleading, she refused to explain the reason. Did I have a black mark on my credit score? Was there something in my past which had come to light that had uh, affected this decision? The woman on the other end of the phone would not explain, stating that it was their company policy not to give a reason when a mortgage offer was withdrawn. Pro protestation to her manager and her manager's manager led to the same response. I felt powerless and wronged. A blank wall of indifference staring me in the face. How could I get another mortgage deal if I did not know why I had been suddenly rejected for this one? The black mark of this rejection would have to be shared if it had not been already and the likelihood of receiving another offer in the few days before we were meant to purchase the property was nigh on impossible. I began to chant at first in the pits of despair, the bleakness of the situation overwhelming me. But after some time, the energy and hope that chanting can provide began to reinvigorate me. I would fight this, but I needed help and guidance. Buddhist guidance to take on the bank. A senior Buddhist leader, Barry, appeared in my mind. Barry had chanted nam myoho renge kyo and practiced Buddhism since the 1970s. When he was a teenager, as a joke, a friend had pushed him off the top diving board of his local swimming pool, paralyzing him from the waist down. This had, this had not stopped him from becoming a highly successful advertising executive and family man. He had swum in the Paralympics, recorded a hit record for Manchester United football team, and above all, had a wealth of Buddhist knowledge, uh, wisdom to share. Still unnerved, I called Barry, who invited me to his home immediately. After explaining the situation and chanting together, Barry gave me clear, practical advice. To win in the struggle, I had to go on the offensive just as Nitrin had. To take on the bank with every ounce of energy I had. He told me to write a letter, no, uh, not longer than one page, stating the issue and outlining that I would, what I would do if they would not tell me the reason for dropping my mortgage or reinstate it. Going to the newspaper and the financial authorities would be my recourse. Once prepared, Barry told me to send the letter to every person in the bank that I could. I returned to my flat that Friday night empowered and with direction. Over that weekend, I devoted myself to alternating between chanting and sending letters. At first, it was difficult finding any emails for the bank as they had consciously avoided publishing them. But after some online research and looking at their annual reports, I discovered the company employee list and how they configured their emails. I literally dodged the company with my letter, like an aerial bomb bombing raids of air, uh, emails. The executive board, the non-executive board, the mortgage service department, the customer relation team, name a department in that bank and pretty much every employee and manager received my letter that weekend. By Sunday night, I had sent hundreds of letters and even engaged my local m member of parliament to get in touch with his contacts at the bank. At around lunchtime on the Monday morning, I received a call. It was the softly spoken head of mortgage services from their na major national bank. 
He started humbly apologising for how I'd been treated and reiterated their policy of not explaining their change in mortgage decisions. However, on this occasion, he had been authorised to make an exception. It transpired, after talking it through with him, that the system had highlighted my mortgage as potential fraud because the lady we were buying from had never got around to officially putting the house in her name after her husband had died over 20 years previously. Not only that, the house had never been sold, having always been in the same family. The computer had seen the original price from the 1920s of a few hundred pounds and flagged this as potential fraud. Once I had clarified these points with him, the mortgage was reinstated. The sale took place and we successfully moved in. The head of mortgage service later wrote to me that as a result of the case, he would review how all customers were treated in such uh, situations. In standing up in this situation, I potentially helped many others in the future. Many people, I imagine, would have just accepted the bank's decisions, faced with a, with a wall of corporate indifference and just given up. Although my troubles do not compare to the scale of what Nitrin faced, the fact that I was able to challenge it was in no way small part down to being... Sorry, the fact that I was able to challenge it was in no way small part down to being part of a tradition trailblazed by Nitrin of challenging injustice and authority through faith. Practicing Buddhism does not mean life will be problem free, nor will everything go away. And let me just pause there because many people believe when you practice Buddhism or spirituality, it's all about transcending your problems, stepping away from your attachments and being in this like solace, happy bubble 24 seven. But I, I've realized even before I was a Buddhist, surely spirituality can't be a life without problems because every problem I've had has led me to this beautiful point now. I actually see all problems and everyone that's hurt me as pretty angelic, to be honest. As long as you can turn poison into medicine, it's your perspective, you know. So um, let me carry on. Buddhism, uh, practicing Buddhism does not mean life will be problem free, nor will everything go your way. However, it can provide a dauntless spirit and the strength to challenge whatever we encounter. Like Nitrin, the Buddhist practitioner can feel energized and even happy in the middle of adversity. Rather than laminating our fate, Buddhism can provide the strength to rejoice. As Nitrin did when he stated, I, Nitrin, am the richest man in all day, in all of present day Japan. He said this despite at the time in February 1272 being in exile on snowbound Sado Island in a draughty, depilated hut facing a pauper's graveyard where dead bodies were left discarded. How do we know what Nitrin was like? Nitrin's confidence in his mission and assured vision for the future has been passed down to us thanks to the preservation of a great many of his writings. Unlike Shakyamuni, Christ or Muhammad, we have the good fortune of a primary source of material written by the sage himself. Nitrin's writings vary from lengthy treaties to government officials to warm, compassionate uh, ep epistles to his followers filled with gratitude and encouragement. Nitrin's wisdom, humanity and unstinting concern for his disciples is amply evident in the modern reader. Interestingly, for a historian, rather than a practicing Buddhist, no contemporary reference to Nitrin in secondary sources such as government papers survive. Nitrin is our sole source from which he was alive in understanding the story of his life. Nitrin holds a preeminent place in SGI Buddhism as the founder of its practice and philosophy and as the teaching master who fully revealed what can be achieved and how to respond in the direst of circumstances. A life filled with joy, compassion, spirit and boundless freedom despite everything that he experienced. That Nichiren should be referred to as an eternal mentor of Buddhist faith is clear, the primary of his role unquestioned. And yet the status afforded him in various Nichiren schools differs and a traditional viewpoint derived from Nichikan, the 26th abbot of Taijaki-ji, has traditionally moved away from, though still has influenced, especially in Japan. In this chapter, we will examine the concept of Nichiren as eternal, original Buddha and the developments away from his established doctrine. In doing so, I hope to unpick our understanding of what a Buddha and Buddhahood really are and to consider how this topic enhances our appreciation of the universalistic approach of SGI Buddhism and the way we regard Nichiren. So, the concept of an eternal, original Buddha. We're getting pretty deep. We are getting pretty deep. For many SGI members practicing in the West, the idea of Nitrin being a timeless, eternal Buddha removed from his identity as a human being may seem quite an alien concept. Certainly, culturally in the West, 
through SGI president Daisaku Ikeda's guidance and our own cultural norms, the idea has been regulated to a relevance, a non-issue. In the month I am writing this, I attended a large meeting at the SGI UK's Grand Cultural Centre, Taplow Court, my favourite place, by the way, on the planet, where a national women's leader emphasised in no uncertain terms that we are all equal to Nichiren Daishonin and all equal to the three founding presidents in potential and inherent worth. And let me just say that one more time. We are all equal to the Buddha. Never, ever forget that. We all have that same potential. And that's just my mission in this life, to try and remind myself and everyone that I meet, never forget who we truly are. We are the entire cosmos. We are the entire cosmos. Ideas of Nichiren as an original or true Buddha are co-signed to the mists of times during the days associated, associ the days of association of Nichiren Shoshu before 1991. And yet the traditional view of Nichiren as a special eternal Buddha of beginningless times still appears at times in SGI study. Even if in reality SGI emphasizes the conception of this idea has radically transformed. To summarize, Nichiren Shoshu priesthood teaching is constructed on the basis of the doctrine of Nichiren as eternal original Buddha, which Nichikan clarified and fully defined in the 18th century CE. Nichikan asserted that Nichiren is a primordial Buddha from the beginning of, etern uh, of eternity, was superior to Shakyamuni Buddha, and that in fact Shakyamuni in the remotest past had previously practiced the law to attain enlightenment under the eternal primordial Buddha, who was Nichiren later to be reborn in the 13th century to propagate the teachings in the latter day of the law. For Nichikan, and by the way, Nichikan is a priest from the 16th century, um, like one of the priests that kind of continued the lineage of Nichiren from the 13th century. So for Nichikan, and by the dint, this, the current Shoshu priesthood, the idea of Nichiren casting off his transient identity and revealing his true self when he survived his attempted execution by the authorities at Tatsunokuchi Beach in 1271 was not the occasion when he fully revealed the universal state of Buddhahood per, but specifically the moment he revealed his special exalted identity as unique primordial Buddha. We will examine this later in this event later in the chapter i think we spoke about this before in 1271 there was a time when the government they took nitrin and they tried to execute him and this is on this is on japanese records nothing to do with buddhism it's all it's all documented the moment they went to execute him like a like an orb went across the sky and the person that had like the sword he was so overwhelmed that he dropped to his knees and he literally he begged nitrin to become his disciple right there so um many people believe that it was at that moment Nitrin himself recognized that he was the Buddha of the latter day of the law. Up until that point, he was kind of just like siphoning through all the documents. And then it was at that moment he recognized his true purpose. So it is worth noting that Nitrikan from the 16th century, the high priest, actually advocated two objects of worship. The first was the Gohonzon, based on the, the Dai Gohonzon, a devotional scroll claimed to be inscribed by Nichiren for all humanity and the fulfillment of his life's purpose. And when we say here, it is worth noting that Nichiren advocated two objects of worship. As a Nichiren Daishonin in Buddhist, we have an object of worship, it's our Gohonzon. And uh, we've spoke about this briefly, even though there's a whole chapter to come in a few weeks, I'm sure, about what the Gohonzon is. But it is just a simple, it's, it's a scroll with a mandala that we face. And it's very clear that we're not chanting to an external Buddha or a statue of a Buddha, giving him the power, you know, externally. It's simply a reflection of our highest potential. And it is, it contains all 80,000 teachings of the Buddha, right from hell all the way to Buddhahood. So that's what we face. Or when, when you chant, your Gohonzon would be, the the candle or the the blank wall that you're currently facing so that's um so nichikan advocated two objects of worship which we don't do anymore so let's talk about that it is worth noting in the 16th century that nichikan actually advocated two objects of worship the first was the gohonzon based on the, the dai gohonzon and the dai gohonzon was like the first original gohonzon that many people today in different forms of buddhism believe is mystical and powerful and it's in japan right now but i think you have to pay to go in to see it and they believe and it, it was inscribed by Nitrin, but they believe because it was inscribed by Nitrin, it's more powerful. And as an SGI member, as a Buddhist, we recognize that's, that's, that can't be the case. How, like, we all have that same potential. And um, in 1991, when the SGI split with the sect that we're talking about here, Nitrin Shu, um, it's because we wanted to give every single individual member a Gohonzon and to take away from the, this, this like potential myth, myth like magic Gohonzon, um, which you can know quite easily makes the power external. So the first was the Gohonzon based on the, the, guy, the Dai Gohonzon. Uh, and by the way, all our Gohonzons are based on that one. Um, a devotional scroll claimed to be inscribed by Nitrin for all humanity and the fulfillment of his life's purpose. But the second 
was the imaginary statue of Nitrin himself in the form of a fashion statue representing the law equals the person. It was only in the mid 20th century under the 59th high priest Nichiko Hori that this latter doctrine was discarded. Founder Soka Gakkai, President Makaguchi and Toda, however, rejected it from the outset and excluded this element of founder worship from the Soka Gakkai's literature and ritual. So from the very start of SGI, we recognize there's no way that we want people to think or identify with a statue of Nitrin because Nitrin himself says like, don't rely on the people rely on the law recognize the mystic law within you if we start praying to him externally it goes into kind of potentially like a tibetan form of buddhism or where you're praying to like amida buddha or it becomes a, a bit more like an abrahamic religion in a sense where it's like these external gods and deities and so from the very beginning of you know 1930 when the, the soka gaka was created it was very evident that we will not have a statue of nitrin that is, we do not believe that's what nitrin's intent was um so yeah an assertion of power. The concept of Nitrin as a special original Buddha has also been used to assert authority and hierarchy in Nitrin Shoshu. So Nitrin Shoshu is the different, they chant Nami Hurenge Kyo on this planet as well, still connected to Nitrin Dai Shonin, but they believe in high priests and they believe that the lay members aren't as powerful as the priests and they are still the ones that own the, the, the original Dai Gohonzun and like it's all magical to them and stuff and it's like you know it's totally opposite to what we believe so the concept of nitrin as a special original buddha has also been used to assert authority and hierarchy in nitrin shoshu for example it claims to give the guide the daigohonzon supposedly special powers based on the idea of the oneness of the buddha and the law purport purportedly embodied in it which values nitrin's status as an original buddha as much as the universal law According to the priesthood, the Dai Gohonzon's special status therefore derives from the special Buddhahood or secret enlightenment of the true Buddha, which Nitrin is said to have revealed and imbued in this particular mandala. So they believe that Nitrin imbued this, like, his Buddhahood in this secret mandala and, like, this, this original Gohonzon. And only by chanting to that specific Gohonzon can you attain it as well, which is ridiculous. Because Nitrin says, you know, yeah, I have inscribed my life in Sumi Ink. Um... But he doesn't mean that it's only in this one piece of paper. So, according to Nitrin Shoshu, as Nitrin's sole ordained emissary in the present, the high priest has become, in recent times, considered by his followers to be the true Buddha himself. So there's still people to this day that are walking around calling themselves the true Buddha because they believe that all the way back, they, they have the, lin the lineage back to Nitrin Daishonin. But we spoke about this on the first one. Uh, that can't actually be because the, the high priest now there was times in like the 16th or the 15th century when there was no high priest to take over so they just gave it to like a 14 year old kid or like a nine year old kid who was not, not even part of it just to hold that position so like the lineage of buddhism from shakyamuni to uh to nitrin daishonin to the high priests right now in japan is completely broken sgi we recognize the true heritage of the law is a spiritual heritage that we're taking on from shakyamuni to nitrin to us we're taking on that spiritual heritage we don't need to have the bloodline of the priests inside of us to believe that we are also the same power so it says here uh the daigo honzen ceased to have any special exalted status for sgi in 2014. we will consider in further detail the evidence related to the authenticity of the daigo honzen and the claims related to it in chapter four with Nichiren transformed into an object of worship, a transcendental or even deified being who brings salvation, the priesthood have been able to take the role as a mediator between the followers and the salvation offered by the Buddha. And, how, and this is the same with all religions, man. We don't need, this doesn't even have to be Buddhist, you know, you could be like, with the Pope transformed into an object of worship, a transcendental or even deified being who brings salvation, the priesthood have been able to take the role as a mediator between the followers and the salvation offered by God. You know, it's exactly the same. The outcome is a top-down hierarchical system which subverts Nitrin's message and debases ordinary practitioners. In a shocking revelation of how the lay believers of Nitrin Shoshu perceive themselves, a Mrs. Yuchida wrote in the lay publication Hokiko, His Holiness, the High Priest, is the only person who has inherited from the Honorable Daishonin, the Dharma body compromising the oneness of the Buddha and the law in a pure form. Consequently, the relationship between priests and lay people should be understood in the form of master and slave, or as upper and lower. Behind this distortion and self-abasement is the concept of Nichiren as a special original Buddha. A delicate shift. I'm going to speak for about five more minutes, and then we're going to we're going to freestyle. The SGI movement, in in practice and approach, is very far removed from st such statements.
However, the clear rejection of this status for Nitrin has been even more subtle than the rejection of the Daigohonzon. Perhaps because as a level tang perhaps because as a less tangible issue, it has naturally changed at grassroots levels without the need for doctrinal debate. In an SGI publication of June 2016, Nichiren is described in the following terms. The treasure of the Buddha from the perspective of time without beginning is Nichiren Daishonin, the Buddha of beginningless time or eternal Buddha, who revealed in his own life as an ordinary person the fundamental law for attaining Buddhahood. A delicate shift can be noted here. Nichiren is afforded the special status of the eternal Buddha and yet he revealed it as an ordinary person. And what he revealed was a fundamental law accessible to all. The scholar Yukio Matsudo, I've actually had the great honour to speak to this person. The scholar Yukio Matsudo has examined this issue based on Nichiren's writings. He considered the view of Nichiren as a special primordial Buddha as nothing but founder worship and a hagiographic defecation of Nichiren himself. Nichiren fully manifested his Buddhahood but revealed in his own life nothing other than a mystical principle that is originally inherent in all living beings. Let me say that again, my brothers and sisters. The mystical principle that is originally inherent in all living beings. That's all Nichiren did. That's why I don't pray to Nichiren. That's why I don't pray to Shakyamuni. Their role, and that's why I don't like, I don't, like bow down to Daisaku Akida because their only ro role is the mystic principle that is originally inherent in all beings. So they just they just revealed there's just like they're an example of how great we could be how much we can remonstrate with government how brave we can be how determined we can be why would i pray to them though you get me in other words the universal essence of enlightenment the word of buddha, the world of buddhahood conversely nitrin held up as the only eternal original buddha creates a dogmatic exclusive and fundamentalist understanding of nitrin and he ceases to be an ordinary person Instead, Mitsudo, Mitsudo suggests Nichiren was a pioneer opening up the Buddha way to all ordinary people and that the eternal Buddha is only found in the present moment when we reveal our Buddhahood. Nichiren's own view of himself. This is the, the last little section I'll read. In supporting this approach, most crucially, Nichiren never claimed himself to be an original eternal Buddha. Traditional Nichiren Shoshu analysis has claimed that Nichiren implied this status indirectly. For, for example, in his major theses, The Opening of the Eyes, he describes himself as the pillar, sun, moon, mirror and eyes of the ruling clan and father and mother to the ruling clan. These may link to the concepts of the sovereign and parent and teacher who would deserve reverence according to Nichiren, but this is absolutely no Im Im implication that they link to a special Buddha from the eternal past. Nichiren unquestionably considered his importance to the peace and future of Japan to be essential, but that he had some special status as a Buddha does in no way come across. The only time Nichiren does purportedly refer to himself in exalted cosmic terms is in a transfer, a transfer document, notably the 106 comparisons and the mystic principle of the original cause. Modern scholars, including some of the Soka University, Consider these writings, which do not feature in the English translated, to be inauthentic creations from a later period. A later period. This case is supported by the works of Professor Maitreya of Soka University, who confirms that his research, from his research, that the doctrine of Nichiren as original Buddha was unknown to Nichiren, Nikko Shonin, his disciple, and to Nikko's disciples. It only emerged in the late 14th century under the sixth high priest, Nichiji, and was given clear articulation by the ninth high priest. Nikko considered himself a disciple of Nichiren and that Nichiren was a Buddha for our, for our times. But this is far more, this is far from considering him the eternal original Buddha. Okay, so let me, let me stop this. So, what we've kind of just discussed today is the idea that first of all most people when they think about buddhism you know they think of shakyamuni or even nichiren and even many sgi members do as they, they believe that this person has come you know transcended um you know born into this world incarnated and that they're slightly different to us and what i'm learning more and more as i practice buddhism and as i kind of like walk my life is that we are no different the causes that we're making right now is no different we have that same power and potential and it is only us, it is only our own minds that limit 
that it's like the guidance from today and it says it and it's, i'll read it one more time it says one of the fascinating things about human beings is this believe for long enough that you are not as smart as, as others and this will actually lead to an intellectual amplitude so what is it's like if you if we don't start to truly understand who we are as beings as sovereign beings and as 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 powerful beings we are the microcosm of the whole universe if we don't start to embody that have faith in that and activate that in, in in from a buddhist perspective we would only be called an ordinary being an ordinary mortal we become buddhas when we remember who we are and this is the thing it's not some fantastical thing where suddenly i'm just gonna i'm i'm just gonna like transcend and fly up into the air this is buddhahood right now in this mo moment how can this not be buddhahood what 15 something souls 13 souls all trying to sit together and just talk about life and trying to work out like how to be the most happiest we can be so that we can be the strongest leaders for our our friends and our family how is this not buddhahood right now this is the thing and this is what i didn't get to, i didn't quite understand for the first few years what is all this buddhahood and i was told you do know every single day when you open your gohonzon or when you sit in front of your flame or your wall or when you meditate or chant or just walk your dog and you're just trying to be peaceful you're attaining buddhahood and um it's quite hard to understand that because it seems like such a fantastical thing but this is buddhahood right now um and this is the beauty of it it's not no static journey you know like when i put this when i close this zoom down in five minutes someone could just disrupt my peace and i'm done suddenly like someone's knocking on my door chatting rubbish and i could drop my energy could drop and i'm suddenly in a life state of hell but what i what we have access to together right now is a practice where we can realign ourselves as quickly as possible and this is what i was it was saying in this chapter life is not like spirituality especially buddhism is not the absence of problems if anything when you really understand life it's a bit controversial here but you almost go bring give me more problems because actually you recognize like I, it's more poison to turn into medicine and actually i can project myself into whole new different directions and i really started to deep that myself you know it's um nitrin says that when problems when like you've got like say you've got a big day tomorrow yeah say you're nervous and like you, you you've got someone that's got like a i don't know like a hospital appointment or, i don't know something that's causing you anxiety yeah say you've got that tomorrow it could either be like a, a, a problem or it could be a cause for you to reveal your highest life state and to fucking to be a leader and so nitrin would say the wise will rejoice while the foolish retreat and i love that the wise will rejoice while the foolish will retreat. Once you know that your mission is to transform karma, to be a lighthouse for all the people around you, for your brothers and your sisters and your family, then you will rejoice when the problems come. Now, I'm not saying like, you know, like, I'm not trying to say like I'm some happy guy that whenever like I found out of someone's da dying or something, I'm like, yes, like, yeah, yeah, I've got more problems. No, of course, it's hard. You know, I've had low thoughts. Like, but let's just say this. If you've been suicidal in this lifetime, yeah you deserve to be the happiest because you've got the most poison to turn into the most medicine do you understand that concept it's like and also every single person around me we're all struggling so what a beautiful what like life is inevitable suffering if i can't feed myself if i can't put a roof over my head to the day i die i'm gonna suffer so that means suffering is always inevitable until the, the, until i until i'm like 100 years old and i die or whatever age i'm gonna pass away i'm always gonna have to put food on my table or try and keep myself warm so the suffering is always going to be inevitable there's that chance that potential always so what a beautiful thing if we can always try and remain in the in the upper highest life states to always choose to transform this suffering from poison into medicine and to be that lighthouse for people that might not have that same strength i was talking to someone that i love in my whole soul yesterday about this is a time when we're all rising up yeah i promise you all of your reflections of me so we're all stepping into our higher chakras we're getting all the downloads right now from the from the from the cosmic sun whatever you want to call it we are all evolving right now but what's going to happen when we evolve what happens when you have a flame the moths come to the flame moths will come you, lower life states will be drawn to you because you're activating something and remember this you only we can only see 0.04 percent of the light spectrum of the entire universe as human beings sentient beings we can only see and hear 0.04 percent of the light spectrum so when angelina moore suddenly starts chanting praying and start activating her higher life state suddenly some friend that you haven't spoke to angelina for like three weeks will start hollering you 
Ch trying to just like you know oh can you help me can you help me but what's happening is because we can only see 0.04 percent of the light spectrum we don't recognize that we are all interconnected we literally have cords to all the people that we've interacted with so that when we start to rise up it starts to aggravate the lower life states in the universe you could always you could almost call it like the devilish functions of the universe now i'm not saying there's actual external devils but the devilish functions in the universe it doesn't want like, it doesn't want me to be super strong and happy so I can lead this call. It doesn't want Maria to be super strong and happy so she can be the leader for her family or Muna. Do you know what I mean? It wants, it's, it's, trying to, it's going to try and bring you down. So suddenly everyone's going to try and come to you and like, can you help me? It's part of the reason I started to really, in this year, remember who I was. I had to come off Instagram because I was like, whoa. Like, so that's how the devil right now, the devilish energies in the universe is going to try and, you know, people are going to try and like, or someone will try and donate money to me and then be like, yeah, but now you need to start, be on the phone for five hours hours when I cry about my like my suicidal tendencies and that's not how it goes that's how you can be manipulated so the reason what I'm saying right here we are all rising we are all expanding yeah be ready for these moths that are going to be attracted to the flame and be strong enough and be compassionate enough to say I'm sorry but I need to put myself first right now me and my children me and my family because if you start running around helping every single person what's going to happen is I always say this to people imagine our life it is like a um it is a garden if we're not spiritually strong, if we're not waking up and doing something to rise up our energy and connect to the quantum field, what's going to happen is our garden's going to be dry. It's going to be like the, the, the desert floor. There's going to be no nothing growing. But if we start to put ourselves first and water our own garden before we try and water everyone else's garden, we're going to have a, a forest. And all the seeds that we are, we've planted are going to start to grow. And then we can eventually, we can start to, I, I'm going to cut off the sunflower and I'm going to hand it to Muna. I'm going to be like, let me post that over to Morocco now because I've got enough to give to you because my garden is so flourishing. But most people, because we're all empathic and we're loving, we're bodhisattvas, man. We're amazing people. We're all Buddhas. Sometimes we don't realize that we're actually slandering our own lives by helping too many people. And never forget this. Remember, we only see 0.04 of the light spectrum. Do you know how powerful prayer is? Because we don't understand it. Sometimes the most powerful thing we can do is pray for them. Like, just pray for them and be away from them. Because actually being physically in their space, like biology to biology, it's not going to work. The lower life state in them does not resonate with the higher life state that you're now achieving. And it's just clashing, it's clashing, it's clashing. If you've ever read, like, the Celestine Prophecy, um, it talks about, oh, what's the word? drama controls like uh, control dramas yeah you're all, everyone's trying to play out all these control dramas but we are activating ourselves especially and mark my words i've chanted every chant you can find on this planet especially when you chant a chant buddhism nam myoho renge kyo it's like from the the core the tectonic plates of of your all your eternal lives start to shift and you really start to see things and i've always, what's the time because we're going to chant for five minutes remember i always say to people don't listen to me i'm just a guy with chicken legs from southwest london Prove it to yourself. Prove it to yourself. Like, when you're chanting, ask the universe, please show me. Remind me who I am. Like, am I wasting my time every Wednesday doing this course? Like, am I like, am I wasting my time chanting for five minutes? I promise you, if you ask the universe for proof, unfathomable things will start to come for you. But it will only resonate with you. And it will be like, okay, wow, I know that this is for me. Like, really quickly, my best friend Chris, who's on the call right now. Let me see where he is. Um... I, don't, I hope he doesn't mind me explaining when he first ever became a Buddhist. Like, really quickly, I was like, yo, brother, you want to believe in Buddhism, yeah? Like, chant for something and, like, and ask for proof. And he said to me, all right, cool, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to chant to become a model. But um, he was already modeling, but he was only really being hired as, like, the black model with, the, like, the amazing six-pack and, like, the good, the good jawbone. He was like, I want to chant to get recognized as a model, but as Chris Reed, like, as who I am as a person, as, like, a, as, as a Buddha, as a photographer. So he did that in, what, uh, 2019, I think it was, beginning of 2019. So he's doing it for about a week, and he's, like, he's, like, walking, like, and, like, chanting, and all I can see is his feet, and he's sending me videos on Telegram, and him just chanting, like, I'm, I'm trying it, bro, I'm trying it, I'm, like, I trust you, and I'm trusting this. What happens, man, gee, and he's my best friend, so this has blew me away. What happens? Suddenly, he gets a job. It's for Ben Sherman. And they've gone, yo, we, we want to we wanna shoot three people, a boxer, a photographer, and like a swimmer. And we've chosen you as the photographer because we heard that you do photography. And if you do this campaign, we're going to put your Instagram, your name, and we're going to have a, like a bio about you. So he's like, ba-boom, massive. That's actual proof, first of all. But it doesn't stop there. I, I go to him to the Ben Sherman shoot. We turn up. It's in, a, um, it's in Notting Hill in a pub. And when we walk in, 
the oldest black member of the SGI. She's like a 90 year old Jamaican lady. She was sitting inside the pub, inside Notting Hill. So we're like, as Jamaicans, me and Chris, we're like, this is super crazy. Like there's, there's this 90 year old, she's just sipping like a tea. She's like overwhelmed because there's like camera crews everywhere. And like, you know, Ben Sherman, like people are w- walking over the place. She doesn't, this is just her local calf, but they've hired it, uh, pub. She, they've hired it for this shoot. So Chris does the shoot. We're like, yay, this is great. A week later, we're in Brixton, walking out of the Brixton centre, and there's a there's a there's a telephone box, and on the telephone box is Chris Reed as a photographer with his name right outside the Buddhist centre. He's never stopped chanting since that day, not once. If anything, he'll chant for two hours. Do you know what? I mean? so that's proof, and only that's for him. You know, and and I can tell you that story, and it might it won't mean you nothing because it will be for you. It will be something that your heart resonates with. And by the way, like that's not like his story. He, we've got books. Me and Chris, we write memoirs now because our heads can't contain it of the proof that we receive, which we know is intergalactic, mystical. We don't know what it is, but that's what that's why I'm so passionate and I have to spread this. I have to help as many people try and just step into themselves. Whether it's chanting Nami Harenga Kyo, I do not care. I just need to remind all of you that we have the power of Jah, of God, of Allah, of Sai Baba within us, but we have to activate it. And you can only activate it by remembering who you are and have that faith. You, last thing I'll say before we chant, it's like, um, if you've got a bell, if you whack it with a toothpick, what are you going to get back? You're going to get a very weak sound back. Ding! It's not going to, it's not going to come back hard. That's what weak faith is. That's people that chant all day long, but they don't really believe that they are the Buddha. That's why there's SGI members that have been doing this for 50 years and they'll say something to me and I just do not resonate because to them, they've become maybe stag- not just SGI members, spiritual people. You know, they've become stagnant or they, they've stopped evolving. They've stopped, they, they believe there's a stagnant, like, like a destination. So they, they, their, their faith to me is like ringing a bell with a toothpick. My faith is ringing it with a, with a boom, like a massive baseball bat. Yeah, because what's going to come back? It's going to be such a strong resonance. It's going to be like brrr, all the way back. So the harder you, you hit that bell of faith, the stronger the universe will come back to you. And that's what I'm trying to say here. The stronger that we have faith in ourselves, the stronger the universe will reflect it back. That's all. When people don't see signs and stuff, it's because they don't believe in themselves. And we, I have to have a lot of gratitude for them people because, you know, they've no doubt come from like a, you know, like an Abrahamic religion that tells you that God is really powerful or, or Allah is really powerful and you can have none of his, none of like the attributes that Allah has. Something like that. When I'm telling you, we are Allah. We are God. We are Muhammad, peace be upon him. We are Sai Baba. So yeah, I got a question and then let's chant. So this is Muna. I have one weird question though, Aaron. Since you've sent me the recording of you chanting, you know I've been doing it daily, but I still cannot chant on my own. I still need that recording. Otherwise it feels weird. Should I force myself to? I wouldn't force myself at all to do anything, my sister. What I would suggest is just keep on going with 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 my chanting. Even YouTube, you know, there's different speeds and chants and stuff. But um, maybe just do this. Next time you're on a bus, just start chanting under your, un, like just under your, you know, your tongue quietly. Because, yeah, it's powerful to chant along to my voice note, but I consider that still like an expedient, you know? You want to be able to find that spirit yourself. And it's hard because it's like, yeah, I'm doing it by myself, I'm doing it by myself. But listen, I could get knocked over tomorrow and suddenly you can't, you can't find me on Telegram. You're going to need to find that spirit yourself. But take it easy. You've got the rest of your life. And ch- whether you're chanting with me or by yourself, this is the important thing. Whether you're back straight or you're in the lotus or you're sitting down, whatever you're doing, you are op- you're deciding, Muna, to open up the doors to your life so you can never do it wrong. You can't pronounce it wrong. You can't just by sitting there and saying, I'm going to chant. You've changed your life. So the only reason I say, you're, you know, you want to slowly practice without me is not because it's taken away from the power, but because there's going to be many times in your life where you don't have that phone. So that's all I would say, you know, so that and eventually, trust me, Moon, I can see it in my third eye. You're going to be sending recordings to people. Trust me. <laughs> so, yeah, let's chant for five minutes and then we're, I'll, I'll love and leave you. Let me just get my beads. And again, just thank you for being with me on this. You know, we're, we're, we're halfway through the second chapter and it is very deep talking about original Buddhas and 16th century priests. But I want you to know all of this is actually going in subconsciously. And like, I want you all to know, yeah, like, I, I don't know much about much, but Buddhism is my field. And all of you, whenever you are around someone that thinks they know about Buddhism, you're going to know more than you can ever imagine. I promise you. And this is what I've learned. I study all day long. And sometimes I'm thinking, how can I retain this information? Because this is the best thing that I could give to someone and when we chant and when we have faith in ourselves, and when you trust your life 
when you trust your life that things that we spoke about today that you completely forgot i promise you yeah you'll be chilling one day in some in some beer garden having a fag yeah and then suddenly sophie's all like dropping bare knowledge <laughs> about buddhism to someone she had no idea she's like whoa at some 16th priest like i'm telling you it's all going in and i'm praying with my soul that it all goes in so don't ever worry about trying to retain things just by being here is transforming your life like i said to muna whether you're chanting with a, a voice note or whether you're not whether you're pronouncing it wrong going listen i know people that uh, are dumb you know like they have no tongue i've got people that have like tourettes they're going numb your her fuck 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 numb your her fuck flag. and it's like does that does that mean that they can't attain buddhahood of course it doesn't so this is what we can never we can never do it incorrectly it's our in buddhism it's called itchinin which means our presence of heart or our seeking spirit if your seeking spirit is correct if your intention is correct you are aligning yourself to true buddhism trust me anyway remember Ring the bell of your life with a hammer, not with a toothpick. Nam yo ho ring ge kyo. 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 Ring ge kyo. Nam yo ho 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 ring ge kyo. Ring gay yo nam yo ho 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 ring gay yo Ring gay yo nam yo ho 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 ring gay yo Ring gay yo nam yo ho 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 ring gay yo Ring gay yo nam yo ho 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 ring gay yo Ring gay yo nam yo ho 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 ring gay yo Ring gay yo nam yo ho 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 ring gay yo i love you thank you so much also a little advice like i'm not sure i wasn't looking at the screen but whenever we chant we always keep our eyes open the reason we as buddhists keep our eyes open when we chant is because we're not trying to transcend this realm we're trying to transform this realm we're not trying to disconnect from this realm so obviously there's other practices we can do at other times for our mental health and stuff like meditation if you want to do all of that that's perfect but chanting daimoku chanting nam mi horenge kyo um it's what it's another book i'm going to um, study in the future but it's like you literally you can you you're in the quantum field you drop your brain to delta brainwaves states and like it's like bringing the quantum field into this realm we're not trying to transcend this realm so it's very much like when we've got our and we face that or the flame but um i love you with my soul hopefully see you next week i can't believe i'm still getting double figures like i was truly ready with my soul i love you sally i was truly ready with my soul to uh to, to, to do this just with like to me and chris like yo chris no one turn up let me just read it to you bro <laughs> like let's just study it together so the fact i've got what three men and all of these queens with me like i love you so much so yeah man have a beautiful evening so much i'm uh, i'm about to do my thing Mwah. <laughs> bye Muna, bye all of you I love you Joe, what a king